Okay, we've been working on, uh, on an idealized process. We've got this idea of a reversible process. Being any process that, of course, we can turn around and run backwards, such that neither the working fluid or any other components of the system or the uh, the the uh, what I guess we call the universe is. <laughs> I should probably just take off my shoes so I can quietly walk around. Here. Good thing I don't have the squeaky chalk. Oh, that'd be great. You don't have any trouble like that. No, that'd be terrible. Can we turn off the lights on the side of the roof? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why don't you just put your shawl over your head? Yeah, there you go. Over your eyes. Nice shield. Hey, cool. Good, now I can concentrate. Um, for, for heat transfer processes, what we're talking about, remember, these are idealized processes, and so there's some idealized things that go into them. For heat transfer processes, we need the, the temperature of the sink, and I'll just pick the hot sink, but it's also true for temperature uh, heat, for heat transfers from the cold sink, for this to be a reversible heat transfer, the temperature difference between these must be almost negligible. Uh, I guess I don't want to put that. It's not the heat engine that's at that, at that temperature. It's, it's whatever was at the top of the cycle, maybe the boiler. we have that simple little cartoon. If the boiler is at uh, approximately the same temperature, very, very close, then we can consider that heat transfer to be reversible. Of course, there's work produced. And for that to be reversible, too, we need some other things that will be coming up in a couple days. For now, we're just going to say it's reversible. And then, uh, then we have heat rejection at the low end. I could maybe put a little H in there because we have the two heat transfers. And that heat transfer is also at essentially no temperature difference. Very, very, very small temperature difference we need for the reversibility of these. And then sharpen your chalk. Huh? You sharpen your chalk. Look how small you're writing. I, I, I sharpened it in, uh, in uh, strength of materials. You were there. You know, it's all big lines in there. No one else was. <laughs> oh, wait. Dana was. Trevor was. Kean was. Malcolm was, yeah. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> so we're, let's put this, this idea of reversible processes into a more uh, a more concrete form and this uh, ideal reversible cycle is called a Carnot cycle after a French military engineer who did an awful lot of this uh, developmental work um, goes something like this. Remember, it's a cycle, so we always come back to where we started. I have to pick some place to start with this, with this little uh, uh, cartoon uh, experiment thing we're doing here. So uh, this one we'll draw. We'll look at as a gas cycle, meaning the working fluid is a gas, and we start with an isothermal expansion with the addition of heat from 
a high temperature source of some kind, whatever that might be. Um, could be uh, uh, just a, a simple combustion process. It doesn't matter, that's not the concern here yet. Since this is an isothermal reversible heat transfer, we need not only the source to be at that temperature, but also the gas itself to be at that tem temperature. And so for the entire heat transfer process of this first step to be reversible, um, then that temperature needs to be constant. As we add heat, that's going to ca cause the piston to move. So this is an isothermal expansion with the addition of heat. So that'll, uh, that'll set for us then our first state point. We're going to start there and then the first process will take us to there. So we'll look at that on our favorite diagram, a PV diagram. Why, anybody remember? Why we love the PV diagram? Because the area under the curve is one. Uh, were you going to say that? And he jumped, he interrupted. His, his hand was up too, Chris. You should really need to show some manners, some respect for your elders. Yeah, you can say it. You <laughs> <laughs> can't say it now, you spoiled it. I gave it back. No, I was wrong. I'll give it no you weren't wrong. The area, the area, area under any process on a PV curve is the uh, work done. So we have a little bit of work done here, going from one to two, going from small area to a larger area at fairly high temperature in an isothermal process. So we'll start at some point one and an isothermal process well, maybe looks something like that. Take us down to some point two there. And that's that's such that the system Remember, this is reversible heat transfer, so not only is the sink at that high temperature, but so is the, the system itself, and it stays at that temperature for isothermal expansion. Um, and that is on a line of constant temperature, so just to emphasize that there. The second step, we go from where we left off at point two, but we take away the heat source and make sure that no heat is lost from the system at all. But the temperature, or sorry, the, the internal pressure uh, is still a bit more <laughs> atmospheric. So there's going to be a little bit more of an expansion. So a little bit more work is done. This is then uh, a process of adiabatic expansion. Remember what adiabatic means? Wait, wait. Chris, just sit on it. Anybody know what adiabatic means? See, still people wouldn't let you talk. They still are jumping in, walking all over you. God darn it. Yeah, no heat transfer. Adiabatic means no heat transfer, and that's what the uh, insulation for us represents. And that process would look something like that. Uh, for a gas undergoing a polytropic process, this is one where K equals a constant. We're going to find what else that means to us in a, in a couple days. We're not quite there yet. Um, 
So for now, we'll just say that, that if this is a gas, that's a polytropic con uh, process, uh, then K is a constant. Remember what K is? Yeah, it's the exponent. But K was a particular type of exponent. When we gave you the polytropic process, that was just an N I used in there, but now I'm specifically using a K, but I did define it probably very quickly a couple days ago. Polytropic index. Uh, it's the ratio of specific heats. C sub P over C sub V. And as we know, those are not constant themselves. They do change with temperature. In fact, we uh, had to spend some time on that. But, uh, uh, and the ratio itself is not always, it's pretty close to constant. But for this process, uh, it actually is. So that's our expansion up to state point three. Then for the next part of the process, now remember we're up here at three. Now we do an isothermal compression by rejecting heat to the low temperature sink. <coughs> we, we bring it, it was out in the warehouse, we bring it in, put it there, and of course, uh, since this is isothermal, then the system has to remain at that temperature because certainly the sink remains at that temperature. That's one of our definitions of a heat sink or heat source is they don't change temperature. So the system must too. And we have an isothermal contraction where the piston now moves down to state point four. Maybe look something like that. And this is also along an isotherm. Remember, all these processes are reversible. We could turn any one of them around. And then for the last little step of it all, we do kind of the same thing we did in the other part where now we bring it back down to the original point from where we just were. Because the atmospheric pressure is still a little bit more than the system pressure, so it pushes down on a little somewhat. But again, we insulate the system during this. So again, this is also an adiabatic process. Trevor, what's an adiabatic process? And so we have an a adiabatic um, return to our original state point one. Well, I guess some other stuff I could fill in just for interest sake. Remember, that was along the line of constant temperature there. And our two heat transfer processes. I do like this new chalk. Might be one of the best things I scored on eBay ever. That brings us back to where we started, and we started again in a, in a power cycle. To understand a little bit of what we've done, let's look at the first two processes. One, two, and three. Remember, the area under the process on a PV diagram is the work done. So this is positive.
positive area, since we're above the x-axis and we're integrating to the right, that's positive. That's the work done by the gas. That's the gas pushing the piston up, actually doing work on the, uh, on the atmosphere. The other part of the cycle on the PV diagram is our little bit of coming back from there, from three to four to one. And this area under the process is negative which means that's work done on the system, by the atmosphere. So that's the work on the gas. And of course, for the purposes of a power cycle, are able to smile today. That enclosed area is what then? That's the net work done by the cycle. Don't forget, for any cycle, and it doesn't matter if it's reversible or not, for any cycle, since we return to where we started, then there's no general change in the system, which means that in a cycle, the work net must equal the heat, net heat transfer. Because we've returned to the original point, there's nothing else that work could do, or that, that energy transfer could do but go in and then come back out into one form or the other. So there's our reversible, ideal Carnot cycle. You could go to any bar in the world where engineers frequent, like Morris Circle. Well, you can't because you can't if you didn't come to class this morning for that. But for this, well, you'd go in and say, hey, you want to talk about Carnot cycle? And they'll probably say no. Mm -hmm. um, but engineers do like to talk about work, so they do that a lot. All right. The, uh, the thermal efficiency of any cycle. Remember how that's defined? No, Chris, don't say anything. Don't oh, you check it. You want to blurt it out? Trevor, you going to jump on this one? What's she doing, checking her breath? No. I think so. Oh, when you're looking over, it's terrible. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I'm staying away over here. <laughs> How do we find the thermal efficiency? Benefit over cost. Benefit over cost. There's other efficiencies. This one we find is the benefit of the cost for a. Uh, huh? <laughs> I was for a power cycle, the reason we run it is to get some work out of the thing. Uh, the cost is for us the QH because that's what we have to supply, that's what we have to pay for. QL is necessary, as we talked about, for any cycle. <coughs> But in terms of the thermal efficiency, it's not considered a cost. Yeah, it's an environmental cost, but it's not a thermal cost. Q net, we know that to be QH minus QL, because for any cycle, 
the net work equals the net heat transfer. Don't forget that. That's a very useful little thing, uh, but it's just easy to forget. Or if you want to rewrite this a little bit, whichever form you like, uh, they're exactly the same. Um, only differ a little bit by uh, the, the, al the algebra there. So either one of those forms is fine. However, that's true for any cycle. But what this does not give us is the greatest possible thermal efficiency that we'd expect from an ideal reversible Carnot cycle. This is, this is true for any cycle. It's true for this one, but it's also true for ones with irreversibilities in it. So uh, part of what we are doing with this reversible cycle is um, trying to find at our, our ultimate limit. So we're going to use something. Um, the book discusses in section, uh, I think it's 6.9, and it's not worth me reproducing the discussion of it here because the result that it gives is so simple. For reversible processes, uh, well, for re reversible cycles, which are made up of reversible processes, but this doesn't apply for uh, individual processes necessarily. Um, it is true, and it's developed in the book, that the ratio of the heat transfer in a cycle, in a reversible cycle, is the same as the ratio of the temperatures. In fact, this is used to establish an absolute temperature scale, and that, again, is discussed in the book. This is ex actually equation 616. So you can see where it is in the book. Uh, actually, the, the, the book doesn't quite have it right because these are in opposite directions. One could be positive, one could be negative. So this is actually the absolute value. Because on an absolute temperature scale, we don't have negative temperatures. So this ratio has to always be positive, and so we need this one to always be positive as well. And this ratio only works in absolute degrees. And you can, you can do it on your calculator in Fahrenheit and Celsius, but uh, it's not going to go any farther than that. So what we can put in here then is the last little bit we need. Now that we have the maximum ideal thermal efficiency. It's still a thermal efficiency, but it's based upon all reversible processes. So uh, we can put a little reversible there just to remind us. It's still W net over QH because that's always true for any cycle. But now we can put these last two little pieces together and say it's also equal to uh, that depending only upon the uh, temperature of the source in the sink. <coughs> which are also the temperature limits on the system anyway. Okay, let's uh, let's let's do uh, a little bit more of that we can add to it. Remember this was a gas cycle, so if we specify that as an ideal gas, 
which I guess makes it an ideal ideal cycle, which is awesome. For an ideal gas is the working fluid for the first part of the process, one to two, that's isothermal. So we can say uh, something like this. Since T is a constant, let's say it this way. Let's say T1 equals T2. <laughs> Since T1 equals T2, then U1 equals U2. Remember the specific internal energy was a function of temperature. Then we can say that uh, Q12 minus W12 which equals N build. That's just the first law. Uh, assuming no change in kinetic or potential energies. Delta U is then zero and we can then say that Q1 equals Q12 equals work one, two, for that first process. So we don't have to actually do the integration under there um, if we already know the heat transfer. That's pretty simple, I hope. For the process two to three, for an ideal gas, adiabatic expansion, in that case, then uh, Q is zero. And so the work comes from the integral under the curve from point two to three. And we already know how to do that integral. P2, V2, minus P1, V1 over one minus N, but N is K for this. And we'll see just where that comes from in a, in a little bit. It's actually jumping ahead a little bit on what the book, what the book has to offer. And uh, what, three or four? Same kind of thing we had in one to two, since that's also isothermal. Well, it should have to be going back the other way. So the heat transfer and the work are again the same. Oh, uh, and if you remember, we know how to integrate a. Uh, we know how to integrate a uh, isothermal process on a PV diagram. So I should have squeezed that in here. M R T H and the log of V2 over V1. And then this is the same kind of thing, only at the low temperature. V um, 4 over V3. And then the last little bit is exactly the same as the other one was, just going in the other direction. Q, 4 to 1 is 0. Work, 4 to 1 is P, 1, V, 1 minus P, 4, V, 4 over 1 minus K. And so we can figure that out for a, uh, an ideal gas Carnot cycle. Don't try to do that with a vapor cycle. And in fact, if we look at a vapor cycle, that's what a gas cycle looks like in a vapor cycle. Using water as the working fluid in the Carnot
system under the dome would look something like this. It's even easier to imagine because an isothermal process under the dome is anyone where either we're evaporating, going that way, or condensing, going back the other. So the first process would look like that, the isothermal expansion. Then the adiabatic expansion to there. Isothermal compression to there. That's a, a, a condensation process. And then an adiabatic compression to finish the uh, finish the cycle. And again, the network is simply the area enclosed by the cycle. You need to do some work. You need to test this a little bit. Shake those cobwebs out of the head over on that side of the room. Let's just about to say, because this side of the room seems a little bit more adult, and then I look at Chris. <laughs> right at that moment. Okay. So uh, if anybody reads mechanical, uh, or uh, oh my gosh, what the, uh, popular mechanics, popular mechanics, in the back, you'll always see all kinds of uh, promises of somebody who's found a brand new energy source, a, a new, new way to run car engines so they're magnificently more efficient and, and uh, it's pretty easy to debunk these. At least take a first step at debunking them by see if they even uh, are possible if the real process, a uh, real cycle that this guy's claiming to have invented violates the condition that no cycle is more efficient than an ideal reversible one, then it's pretty easy to determine whether or not their, their uh, well, the technical term is full of hooey. So here's a claim by one of the vendor that Carry one? No. Box. Go, you work at Hannaford. You have box cutters with you at all times. Yeah, ask Alan. If Alan's not armored, it's good. When it goes dull, let me know. Surely you're carrying a concealed weapon. No? You lost your permit. Man, that sucks. All right, so here's the claim. From a heat source at 500K, the, the uh, inventor claims that uh, a thousand kilojoules is drawn off of that, of which 410 is turned into work, with of course the rest being rejected to a heat sink at 300K. And you as the patent examiner, since Albert Einstein moved on to other things, that position's open, you have to uh, take a first look at, see if this claim is even possible. Chris, you think it is? 
Well, then we're all done and I'll just raise the board. Let's let's uh, let's let the rest let's let the mere mortals catch up, shall we? Especially those working at somewhere around forty eight percent capacity today. Is that about right, Phil? It's just a little bit over what's possible. Just get up and go get it. People all the time get up and just leave. <laughs> How long were you? <laughs> That's dedication. That's dedication. That guy, he was going to sit there the whole time. Hey, while you're up, uh, Paul would like his smokes. <laughs> oh, you got him. Never mind. You were about them the other day. Thanks. I thought. I thought uh, little hair of the dog, huh? <laughs> nobody, nobody knows what that term means. That that one? Hair of the dog, bitch it. Huh? Hair of the dog, bitch it. Yeah. You, well, you know what I'm referring to in this context. Yes. Hopefully it's only have this spike with no. something. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what you do? You're drinking like five. He is? Yeah. No, I don't think it's Irish. Oh. Irish dog. Irish thing. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work. Really? Can't happen. Well, let's see what the others say. That's from engineering. Let's see what legal has to say about it over here. What did we decide? We decided to wait until Alan just blurts out the answer? <laughs> yeah, I don't blame you. It always happens. Somebody's got to do it. Somebody's got to blurt it out. Well, what's there to check? We've got uh, thermal efficiency we can check here using the regular definition of thermal efficiency. That one's easy to check. Well, easy to calculate. There's nothing to check yet. But then we can also check the ultimate, the ideal, the maximum efficiency for a reversible cycle using this. And we know from uh, what we looked at, I, I think it was on Wednesday we did it, that the ideal efficiency has got to be more than the real efficiency, otherwise we have a violation of the second law. So it's better checking those numbers. And if his claimed efficiency is greater than the reversible efficiency, then you you reject the patent application in the strongest German accent you possibly can. Because that's what Einstein himself would have done. But yet. I say no one didn't. Yet. So nine. 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 What's yet? That's the Russian. 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 Oh. Oops. And you get your Cold War, Cold War spies all mixed up. All right, easy to check these numbers. In fact, you can practically uh, practically do them in your head. So he's claiming a net production of 41 kilojoules of work at a cost of input heat, 1,000 kilojoules. Of course, the efficiency then is 41% as his claimed efficiency. In terms of the reversible efficiency, that's 1 minus uh, 300 over 500. Again, make sure that you're using uh, one, both the same units on the temperature there and using uh, absolute temperatures. And so that comes out to be, what, 40%. 
And so you say, in no uncertain terms, nine, nine. That sounds, sounds great when the whole room does it. Especially with, with Paul and his raspy voice because he's ruining his vocal cords there. He's got all that congestion. And his lungs not clean like you. No. Yep, see, sings beautifully. <laughs> What? Someone has to be raspy. Somebody why? Has to be raspy. Why? Yeah. Why? Why can't? Why can't everybody have beautiful melodic voices uh, like I do? <laughs> I don't know if I like the look on the face of that one. All right. There's another claim. Uh, this guy promises a refrigeration cycle. Oh. Can we do all this for a refrigeration cycle? Will all this work? Why not? Why not? Because all these processes are reversible, which means we can just run the cycle backwards, and when we do that, we have a ref uh, refrigeration cycle. So here's the claim for this inventor. It's a new guy. This one we shot. <laughs> this one. Uh, he didn't have his math wrong. His math was fine. His, his uh, physics was wrong. Shouldn't have been off by any. Oh, in fact, uh, as a matter of fact, I used this at, uh, at GV just before I left. The, uh, the uh, aircraft people said that they wanted to take the aircraft engines and take the the hot oil that's produced in these engines for the lubrication, use the heat from the hot oil to run a small turbine. And they hired, I worked at the corporate research center, and the businesses in GE would hire us to do those kind of things for them. And so they wanted me to take the hot oil available in the engine, aircraft engine, and make a little turbine that would supply just a little bit of extra energy. And the first thing I did was calculate this and found out the expected efficiency was, I don't remember the numbers now, but oil's not that hot. And the low temperature is still only going to be whatever the atmosphere is for the engine anyway. The efficiency came out to be something like 8% or something, which is no, there's no way a turbine that's running at 8% efficiency, and that's ideal efficiency, so the real efficiency is going to be somewhere well low of that. Um, I told him, you, you can't do it. And I, I almost was. It, I was. it was just as far as I was going to leave anyway, and the guys at aircraft said, we're paying for you to do it, so do it. And I said, well, thank God I'm leaving because I don't want to do that. I want to take on a job that has virtually no chance of success. So I, I don't know to this day if it actually went anywhere. I can't imagine it did. I know the guy who was taken over was not real excited about doing it. All right, so there's the sinks. And... The heat transfers and the work input required to do this. Let's see which one of these we have. Uh, oh, we have work rates and heat transfer rates on these. So all we have to do is put a dot over them and make sure the units work. Uh, the work required is 3,200 kilojoules per hour. And the heat pulled from the cold source, and it is a refrigerator, so that's what we're trying to do, is 8,000 kilojoules per hour. So uh, you need to test his claim for validity. Actually, uh, this was a him, this is a her who came in there, so right there you expect it to be a uh, better chance of being valid. Well, at least if it was Taylor. It was clear thinking today. Oh, wait.
through here. Oh, 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 I'm so nervous. Let's see if Alan did. What am I looking at? Oh, I can't look at that. That doesn't tell me anything. Oh, okay. Well, Phil fell for it. First, he's hung over. We expect that. Mm -hmm. God knows what she's doing today. Yes. <laughs> Let's see. Oops. Dana fell for it. All right. Let's see. Paul. Paul's writing something entirely different. We don't use heat uh, thermal efficiency for refrigeration cycles. What do we use? Coefficient of something. Coefficient of performance. This is a refrigeration cycle. Still defined the same, still defined as benefit over cost. The benefit being the heat drawn from the cold source, at least for a, uh, for a refrigeration cycle. Remember, for a heat pump cycle, the purpose is to produce heat. Uh, and the cost is the network being done. That's true for any uh, refrigeration cycle. For a, ref a reversible refrigeration cycle, we can do the same thing we did before where we replace the heat transfer or the heat transfer rates by the temperatures at that place. So that's the coefficient of performance for a refrigerated refrigeration cycle for an ideal refrigeration cycle. So those are the two things you need to compare where the real coefficient of performance cannot be greater than the reversible ideal coefficient of performance. So Paul caught that COP. Who else did? Yeah. Uh, it's easier to catch when I write it up on the board, isn't it? Okay, so you, you can check the claim by this inventor. How do they even make it into the magazine? How do they make what? Into the magazine, like as a... Because they pay. As an advertisement. They pay. They don't think it's wrong. They, they're, 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 you, the number of quacks out there inventing perpetual motion machines, new, new power systems, all that. They're just there's an unlimited number of them. Yeah. But how can the mechanics solve them? It's also the the same place in the back of the magazine where they sell those x-ray vision classes. <laughs> Do they not advertise things in the magazine that would like make you smarter and realize that you're somebody's Oh yeah, there's there's herbal supplements that make you smarter. You can buy those as well. So they don't like discuss their and and there's there's things you can buy to make you infinitely more attractive to women. <laughs> Actually, the key would be to not buy it. That money is infinitely attractive. No, sir. That's not what they claim. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we can come up with that value. That's what? Uh, 8,000 over 3,200. Notice you don't have to make these into kilojoules per second in the kilowatts, as long as they have the same units, they'll divide. So what's that come out to be? 2.5? And then using the temperatures, what'd you get? You have to do it in Kelvin, right? I don't know. It's your job. I'm, I'm, uh, 
I'm buying next month's issue. So I'm unavailable for comment. Mm -hmm. um, the way you've got that written up there, mm -hmm. all over work. Mm -hmm. 8,000 is 2 H. What? Yeah, I was going to say. Oh, <laughs> your oh. answer should be 1. No, no. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, these should be reversed. I'm so used to putting the a uh, high one first and a low one second. There we go. Sorry. That makes sense. Yeah. So what about the temperature though? The, the ideal COP calculation? 9.9. If you didn't get 9.9, .9, it's because you didn't put uh, the temperatures in ideal, uh, sorry, absolute temperatures. So this claim uh, at least is valid from a second law standpoint. Yep. What's what's a realistic, uh, you know, approachable percentage or COP? Two two point five is is pretty typical. When the when the, the ideal is that high. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's actually it's common to not even get halfway there. Yeah. Uh, we, what's we, making that? What's what's causing that huge loss? Friction, for the most part, heat production, uh, wear and tear, leakage in some of the components, the compressor, and, and uh, that's the main place. Um, then even just insulation in the refrigerator itself. Those kind of things are all irreversible losses. Heat transfer, realistic heat transfer and friction are the big irreversibilities, big source of irreversibilities. So the lo so so it's kind of a paradox. The loss in a refrigeration unit is heat loss, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, it, well it's but if it's in your kitchen, yeah. then you're, it's saving you heat anyway, right? So it's not really a loss, is it? Yeah, well, you hear about people who, uh, in the heat of the summer, open up the refrigerator door to cool off. Yeah, and then the refrigerator heats up the uh, house. <laughs> refrigerator works harder and harder and harder. It's putting out more and more heat. Yeah. It's just their brains can't go back there. <laughs> so, uh, but if, if, you, if you put a little fan and blow it out, I guess you, you localize where the heat is. And it's still a pretty dumb thing to do. That's why God made shorts and, and sleeveless t-shirts. Okay, so here's here's your last problem. This is your get out of class question. A Carnot heat engine with air as the working fluid in a piston cylinder setup. So that's the very first one uh, we opened class with, the little piston cylinder thing. Uh, closed system. So it has air as the working fluid. Um, we have uh, two kilograms in the system and uh, the temperature limits <laughs> 750 K on the top end and 300 on the bottom. Two other things known. Heat transfer during the isothermal expansion. It's your job to figure out what that where that is. The, is uh, 60 kilojoules. And at the end of that expansion, the volume is 0.4 meters cubed.
That's enough for us to find a couple things. The thermal efficiency, find the pressure and the volume <coughs> at the start of that isothermal expansion. We have the volume at the end of it. but we want the pressure and the volume at the start of it. Also find all Q's and W's for each of the four processes. idea with these things if possible. Uh, draw a sketch to help with it. Yep. So, um, for our efficiency... Um, you spelled nine wrong. Oh, I don't know if that's spelled right. I was thinking of the number nine. Go ahead. Which efficiency is it? Um, in the percentage? Or do you have to convert to the percentage? In other words, for the first one we had 0.4, for the second one we had 2.5. How would you rate that as a percentage? You don't. Oh, you don't. Coefficient of performance is not written as a percentage. But thermal efficiency or other efficiencies uh, can be. Okay, if you remember our air, our, our gas uh, Carnot cycle looked something like that. So we'll go ahead and keep the same numbers, a little less confusion. But we have to figure out which one of those pieces and parts that we were given there in the write-up before we can figure out anything else. So the uh, isothermal expansion, which one of the processes is that? One to two, uh, but uh, remember that's the temperature of the gas. This is the temperature of the heat sink and the heat source. So what temperatures are these related to the isothermal process across here? Remember for reversible heat transfer, the temperature difference between the system and the sink are negligible. So this is the 750K isotherm. So that's the, iso, the isothermal expansion. That's the heat transfer doing that. So that is Q12. At the end of that, the volume is 0.4, so what we have is that V2 is 0.4, and uh, the only other part we have is that the 300K is across the bottom here during the isothermal Contraction, compression. And that, that is a, a 300K isotherm across there.
So from that, you should be able to find out the thermal efficiency. That that ought to be pretty straightforward. We've just we've been looking at that. Um, so the ideal of Carnot cycle. So we're looking at the reversible heat transfer. That only depends upon the temperatures. But then some of the other pieces, uh, some of the other pieces, we'll need to take a, a do a little bit of thinking about, I guess. But that's okay. We got some time. Not lunch time yet. Nap time maybe. Sleepy Chris, think about Fiona and Phil. Man, they're up all night, carousing and drinking, dancing on the tables. Maybe I was too. Good boy like you. Is Chris with you? He was invited though, he just he didn't get his invitation in time. I didn't get mine in time either. I think it's in the mail when I get home. Send your school now. It's where? School mailbox. Oh, it's probably buried under Malcolm's homework then. <laughs> Malcolm refuses to actually hand homework to me face to face. Okay, hopefully no trouble with the thermal efficiency. But then this step might uh, might take a little bit. Why is that? Yeah, because the temperatures are constant, therefore the internal energies are constant. If we're neglecting Ke and Pe changes, then that's true. And so that then is dependent upon the uh, ratio of the volume.
can get v1 from, well, we can get v1 from this, yeah, because you know the heat transfer, that was the uh, 60 kilonewels. So we can get v1 from that. side parts. That's adiabatic. So that's just, that's a cherry picking, picking the easy stuff, and leaving the harder stuff to somebody else. Since this process, 1, 2, is isothermal, then T is a constant, which means PV is also a constant. And that constant happens to be MRT. So you can use that to find, uh, you could use that to find P2, and then use that to find, uh, um, actually use that to find both P1 and P2.
It's okay. My bad. It's gold. <laughs> All Q's and W's for each process. Anybody have that pressure and that volume? I don't know if you do. Yeah? For volume, I have 0.35. Come on, don't shout it out. It's a get out of Now it's ruined. It's not a get out of class question anymore. Yeah. I've just ruined it. Boy, Malcolm, I would hate to meet any of these guys in the parking lot. Is this right? How about. Uh, how about finding the work for those other processes? No. Let's hear it. Go ahead and shout it out. I haven't stopped anybody else. You don't want to. You want to Oh yeah, you don't want to shout out. You want to whisper? You want to text me? Hmm. Want to just hold it up? Oh, I can't read your handwriting though. No. Sorry. No. Now, remember using this and the first law and no changes in kinetic or potential energy we can find the work using just that. use the air tables to find those. from a 
experience. Chris? Chris. There's more dirt all over the floor over here. Again. Oh, there's no dirt on no, over here. Oh, uh, I did that? Yes, I assume so. You did it last time. Not single bag. <laughs> you throw dirt. Look right? how beautiful the meat is. Yeah, yeah. I wonder why. It's all over here. <laughs> Think I'm stupid? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll see who's stupid. Tell us how to find work on 3-4. Actually, you can find this one using that uh, absolute temperature scale thing. That'll give you that heat transfer that gives you the work then. And that leaves you only have to find the work for 4-1. That's all that's left. All the hard part is done. It. Something missing, Ken, up here? Need help with? Nate, okay? Yeah? Chris doesn't believe you. Yeah, I expect it to be that high. That seems really high. Of course, I'm happy. Might as well think you're stupid. Clearly, there's still 60 and said as much. I did a good job today. I didn't lost any capital. I don't understand it. It's even here on the chair. Yeah. On the chair. Okay. It's all across here. I, it does. I can see exactly where you walk. Right <laughs> across here. Paul, you're getting me in trouble. That's the worst. There's a sign here to refer to the three. Uh, okay. Yeah. Six hundred six hundred. Yeah, six hundred seventy-six kilojoules seem right. Yeah. Sound right. Yep. Oh, okay. just, we're yeah. just we have we all have that answer. But we're like that seems so like so much. You keep in mind. When the first stage. Based on your six. experience on uh, uh, running ideal cardio cycles. Yeah. Yeah. In your garage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we just compared it to the sixty of the first stage. Didn't realize it would be such a difference from sixty yeah. to jump to jump up. To well, don't it's, don't forget it's not a scale drawing. So don't, don't let that. Uh, I won't call it a cartoon. I did that once. I got called on that. Say, well, if it's a cartoon, we can put anything we want on the board. I said, oh, okay, yeah. go ahead. So it's not a cartoon. It's a scale drawing. This is a cartoon. That's a cartoon.
Okay, Phil, go on home, back to bed. Okay. Can we just use the thermal efficiency then to find the last?